All right, welcome back. Welcome back to a new episode of Rust for the Absolute Beginner Tutorial Series. And today we're going to continue on with part two of our ownership episode. All right, so to continue on from where we left off from ownership part one, the previous episode, okay, today we're going to talk about the three very important rules of ownership. All right, so as you can see over here, Okay, the first rule, right, which says each value has an owner, yeah, and the second rule says that there can only be one owner at any point in time for that value, yeah, and finally, the third and last rule says that when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped by Rust and the memory deallocated, yeah, so. Let's see an example, a very simple first example of how these three ownership rules come into play. All right, so over here we have a very simple main function, okay, with just one line of code inside another block. Yeah, so we have let s, which is a string, equals to string from cake. Yeah, All right, so as you can see, this is very simple, quite straightforward example. So watch what happens if we try to print out s out of the block. Yeah. So s is comma s. Right. So if we save this, right, notice that now the Rust compiler will give us or throw us an error saying that hey, we cannot find the value s in this scope. Yeah. So remember in one of our previous videos, we talked about scope, right? This S is only available in this block of code. Yeah. So the scope, the available scope is only within this block of code. Yeah. And once we get out of this block, okay, Rust will deallocate and drop S. Hence, S will become invalid. Hence, we are getting this error. All right. And remember if we follow the three ownership rules, right? The first rule, each value has an owner, yeah? Over here, S is the owner of the value cake, right? So this is how you can interpret this line of code as well. All right, next, let's see why it is important for us to learn when the owner for a value changes, right? That is when the ownership moves, yeah? So if we look at the code here, we have let a equals to 10 over here, okay, which is an integer 32. And the next line, let b equals to a, yeah. So what is happening here is, okay, for let b equals to a, okay, Rust is making a copy of the value in a and binding it to b. And this is because integers, right, you know their size, which is fixed. Hence, it is a deep copy. Okay, we'll get to that later as well. Yeah. If we look at this almost exact same example, but we use strings, right? So here we have let string one equals to string from break and let string two equals to string one. All right, it might look the same as the integer version that we just saw okay but if we dive into what is actually happening yeah what is actually happening okay is different right so remember what a string looks like when we dive into it let's take a look at that diagram again yeah okay so let's go back to chrome all right yeah so remember this diagram that you saw in part one of the ownership episode, yeah? All right, so what really happens when we let string two equals to string one is this, yeah? Okay, we just copy the information on the stack, okay, without actually making a deep copy of the string break in a heap. Yeah, so this is actually what happens, and this is how Rust keeps the runtime performance from becoming expensive. All right, now remember in one of our earlier videos, 
Okay, we talk about scope and how variables can go out of scope. And when that happens, they are dropped and they are memory deallocated. Yeah, or getting cleaned up. Yeah, so in this diagram here that we have ongoing, yeah, so imagine if Rust tries to free both string one and string two when they both go out of scope. Yeah, it will try to free the same memory. Yeah. So that is known as a double free error and it could lead to memory corruption, which is not something we want. Yeah. Okay, so luckily for us, you are luckily for us, Rust does not do that. Instead, when we do string, or rather, instead when we do let string two equals to string one, yeah, Rust considers string one as no longer valid. All right, so for example, if we go back to the code, right, let's go back to Helix, right? So I mentioned that Rust considers string one as no longer valid. So if we try to use it, for example, string one is string one, right? And let's save that. Right, notice how the Rust compiler throws an error and says borrow of move value string one, all right? Because it is no longer valid. Okay, so what is actually happening here is, let's go back to our diagram. All right, so this is actually what is happening when we do let string two equals to string one, yeah? So you can see that Rust considers string one as no longer valid, hence string one is now grayed out. Hence, when we try to use string one again, Rust throws an error. All right, so this is also known as shallow copying in other programming languages. Okay, but in Rust, we call it move of ownership. Okay, as you can see here that the actual string data, which is break here, yeah, is not copied. Now, if you want to deeply copy even the heap data of the string, yeah, as shown, Okay, in this diagram here, this heap data here, if you want a copy of this, okay, we can use the clone method, right? Let's go back to the code. Okay, with Helix, once again, my current favorite editor. Yeah, so right now we have this error. So, okay, so as I mentioned, we can use the clone method and that will copy the heap data as well and that will resolve the error. Right, so if we take a look at what is really happening now, let's go back to the browser. Yeah, so from this, it becomes this. Yeah, so you can see now string one and string two are both still valid because now even the heap data is copied. And of course, this is more expensive as compared to a shallow copy. All right, now that we have understood how ownership can change between variables, okay, let's take a look at how ownership works with functions, right? Let's go back to Helix. Yeah, so over here we have, uh, of course, the main function and a very simple function called this function takes ownership. Okay, so firstly we have a string one. So let string one equals to string from pizza. Okay, and we call the function and we pass in string one okay and inside the function right inside the function this function takes ownership okay basically we are just printing out a string is uh, it should print out pizza yeah okay but now we can see that there's no errors okay but watch what happens if i try to use string one after the call to the function all right so if i can say printing string one now again and if we use string one here and save this okay notice now rust throws an error and it says borrow of move value string one all right so what is happening here all right so basically the owner of the value pizza right has already moved to this function yeah and thus, string one itself is deemed invalid by the Rust compiler, right? Hence, we have this move 
error. Yeah. Okay, so if we take a look at what is happening visually, let's go back to our Chrome. All right, so here, imagine this is string one, all right? This whole thing is string one, yeah? This is string one, and this is the function. And here at the bottom center, we have the Rust compiler. So at the start, when we say let string one equals to string from pizza, okay, string one is the owner of the value pizza. Okay, but once we call this function takes ownership, okay, and we pass in pizza, this happens. All right. Okay, so now string one does not own the value pizza anymore. Okay, so if we try to use string one again, okay, Rust will know that hey, string one doesn't own pizza anymore and it's invalid. Hence, we get that error. Yeah. All right. And let's go back to the code and see how we can resolve this. Okay, so here we are back in Helix. Once again, my favorite editor. Yeah. All right, so let's see how we can resolve this. Okay, and the most straightforward method to resolve this is to transfer the ownership back. Yeah. So to do that, we can modify the signature of the function to make it return something. Yeah. So we can say make it return a string. Yeah. For example, okay, and we can say let's return the string that we pass in. All right. And over here, we can say let, let string to equals to this function takes ownership. And we pass in string one. All right. And of course, here we'll change it to string two. Save that. And you will notice that the error goes away. Yeah. So what is happening here is from the first line, okay, string one is the owner of the value pizza. Okay. And when we call this function takes ownership and we pass in string one, right? This function takes ownership of the value pizza. Okay. But it uses it and it passes the ownership back to here, which is string two. Hence, when we use string2 here, Rust does not throw an error. And now it is working. And the Rust compiler is very happy about it. Yeah. All right. So we saw how we can change a function to return, for example, a string yeah, to transfer the ownership back. Okay. But what if you want to return multiple values from just one function? Right. So this is an example of how you can do so. So over here, we have a string 1 that has the value change the world. Okay, and we have a function called how many words that returns a tuple, uh, which consists of a string and a u size, yeah, which is how many characters, or how long the string is. Yeah. So this is an example of how you can return multiple values in one function. Okay, but this can possibly get quite tedious if you want to always ensure that you are transferring or if you want to transfer the ownership back. Okay, but luckily for us, once again in Rust, okay, we have something called references, yeah, which will allow you to use a value without transferring that ownership. Okay, so next, let's learn about references and borrowing.